Um, welcome to our International Women's Day webinar 2022, hosted by the Ministry of Women, Youth and Children's Affairs, the National Unity Government of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar. Um, our theme this year um, is Break the Bias, Reject Dictatorship. It's a theme for Myanmar's International Women's Day. So we would like to um, happily welcome you all and so delighted that you could join us today. Recording in progress. Um, basically, you know, we want you to imagine a gender equal world, a world pre free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination, a world that is uh, diverse, equitable and inclusive. Yeah, a world where difference is valued and celebrated. Together, we can forge women's equality. Collectively, we can all break the bias. So in Myanmar, since 2000, uh, February 2021, a military regime's coup on a democratic civilian government led to a nationwide civil disobedience movement and people revolution called the Spring Revolution to reject the dictatorship. So Myanmar is now at the juncture to end all forms of discrimination and end dictatorship. We would like to welcome you once again to this webinar and we have amazing panelists who will then give you all the insight uh, information about current updates in Myanmar as well as our international activists and human rights defenders. So we are really excited to welcome them all. Um, first and foremost, for our uh, remark um, opening um, speech, um, I would like to respectfully welcome our Myanmar Acting President, Doa Lashi La. Doa Lashi La is a Kachin politician and a lawyer who formerly served as the President of the Kachin National Conservative Council, and he has been serving as an appointed Vice President of the National Unity Government for NUG of the Myanmar since April 16, 2021. So I would like to now um, humbly and respectfully welcome our Acting Vice President, Mr. Uh, Doa Lashi. Sir, I welcome you to take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, as the acting president of the National Unity Government of Myanmar, it is my honor to give a welcome speech for the celebration of International Women's Day. This year, together with you all, women in our country and around the world. On this very special day, I would like to take an opportunity to recognize the remarkable role of that women of Myanmar have been playing in the Supreme Revolution, which is the People's Revolution to liberate the entire people of Myanmar from all kinds of the dictatorships. Women of Myanmar have been visible at the forefront of peaceful protests and the civil disobedience movement, humanitarian and fundraising efforts, political leadership, and even people's defensive was against the illegitimate military dictatorship. There are numbers of silent heroes as well. In this day, my respect, thoughts, and prayer reach out to the fallen women, including mothers and girls, and those who are still unjustly imprisoned as they briefly risk their lives in fighting against injury, injustice. The words and actions of Myanmar women have been exemplary in breaking various kinds of bias, discrimination, and superstition in our society. For example, last year, around International Women's Day, women of Myanmar led nationwide <coughs> peaceful campaigns against the Jeep Honda by raising women's surround as flags. Almost the entire main population joined the campaign by holding or waving Sarong flags, breaking the deeply rooted prejudice in our society that women's items are regarded as dirty. Therefore, men should not even touch them. I am very proud of our women, our men and women for this remarkable initiative. I can cannot stress enough that the bravery, 
primitivity and the sacrifice of Myanmar women and girls from diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds have been extraordinary. And yet our women and girls here in Myanmar and across the globe continue to face all kinds of discrimination and harassment at the workplace, corporate or political leadership, and so on. Women's issues are not something that should concern only women. We must all play our parts to bring about a world free from bias, stereotypes, and discrimination against women. Gender equality should be permanently integrated into our core values, way of thinking and doing things for the rest of our lives. It is not something we do only when we have extra time or only when we feel like it. Last but not least, let me end by saying that we cannot end the dictatorship without women's power. We must have women's leadership and participation to win this people's revolution against the dictatorship. Break the bias, reject the dictatorship. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, great, remarkable speech and opening. And thank you for uh, welcoming all of our women leadership in the modern world, especially for our country, Myanmar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I do apologize because the beginning, there's a bit of a heartbeat. So if I speak, spoke fast, um, I will slow down now. And um, so that you have time to, um, to get used to what is happening from our webinar today. Um, our remarkable um, activity that we would like to show you is a video presentation. Um, so we would like to now, since our president have done his opening remark and opening our International Women's Day, we would like to now show you this remarkable video um, short presentation. Please take a look. The majestic Salween River marks the border between Thailand and Myanmar. The two countries are near in distance, but worlds apart in the reality on the ground. A year after the Myanmar military seized power in a coup, civil war is raging across the country. Doctors who joined the civil disobedience movement are now working in conflict areas controlled by armed ethnic groups. The Myanmar military has been launching airstrikes targeting hospitals and schools in violation of the Geneva Convention that mandates the protection of civilian lives and facilities. Dr. Rose visits one of the hospitals in the Karen ethnic area, destroyed by bombs and artillery. Uh, this is the operation theater room and it's also, also damaged. <laughs> Patients from destroyed hospitals are evacuated to makeshift jungle clinics with the most basic facilities. Dr. Shin walks through the remnants of a now empty high school. Grade 12 is the highest grade, I think. This room is very damaged. Not only the bone, they can even use their long range gun for air strike because there are some small holes in the roof. Ethnic students from the destroyed high school now study in a bamboo hut hidden under the jungle to avoid being hit by aerial attack. Na Lei Buya is in her final year of high school and aims to go to university. She plans on opening a tourism business in Karen State. Dr. 
no he kalawera ta le bo o no di sa web sinya na pe bo se ke sa wa te wa di te da le o se ke he la kho ni he wet se he wet ti wa mo ko da ni he da le bo yi he kalawera he ka pli ka pu da du ko so wa po se ni phang ni le ju po te ni phang ni ma we te ni to o te ni ba da ti ble lo lo la la di to la pu pu ya mo no lo ni ba pli ba pu da ko pro ta le ko so ha ko bo ju he ga do mama mama yem lo di a we te ni Pilihan mah, pilihan tu nunggu awak ni mikir. Di sini dah korang kau lihat waktu malu awak jodoh ramai hilal ni lihat ni berani. Kau pakai awak ni, kau pakai pohon ni berani apa? Wah, kau korang kau lihat awak berani apa lagi sekarang ni? Taruh pahli, pahli apa mami tu? Nanti tu nak waktu ni kita selesai kita lama. Tapi ni waktu ni begini bang. The Ambia Christian Institute is a technical school where students can learn new skills in computers, English, and art. For many of these Karen youth, this is their only chance for higher education. Na Se and her friends ran for their lives in the middle of the night when their school was targeted. And our, our Karen people now faced with many difficult conditions. Well, I hope one day we, we will get a independence and will will be with our own nation. Na Susanna Lalaso is a leader in the National Unity Government, a longtime activist and former member of parliament. She sees the suffering of her people firsthand and stayed at the Myanmar border to help them. It is not good, you know, no development, no education, no public service. You just thinking of how to live for the tomorrow. For me, when I sleep, when I get up, oh, it's another day to live. We have to think only day, day, to, day by day, you know. You could not uh, have a long plan. You could not have your future, your education. Uh, you, so this is maybe many people feel like that. If you wake up, oh, you, you look at the sky, oh, this is our day, to live another day. Children have been especially traumatized by the war. Unable to go to school or play with friends, their sense of safety is gone. <laughs> นอกโฮเตลลงยาเรามีหลังโฮเตลลงยาเรามีหลังอ่ะนี่อันนี้โอ้อะกูอ่ะบาดตายไม่ได้ตายลิมเนี่ยตายรู้แกน่าได้มา
ကိုယ်ညီညာဘီးကြပါလက်တွေ့ကြရဲကိစ္စတွေကိုပါဝင်ပေးကြပါလို့ပဲပြောချင်မှာတယ်ဒီထက်ပိုပြီးတော့က
and its quest to retain its freedom, independence, and democracy. Afghanistan, too, has been overtaken by radical extremists, the Taliban. And all of you know so well what the military coup has done in your own country. In each of these cases, including your own, millions of people have been forced to flee as refugees and internally displaced. And women and children are bearing the brunt of the violence. We all felt hope for Myanmar when political change transpired in 2011. I cherish my memories of my trips to your country and of working with so many of you as you nurtured civil society, helped women to move into the economy, ran for elective office to the parliament, and so much more. Despite the challenges, it was a time of hope as you work to build your nascent democracy. A terrible reality was the genocide perpetrated against the Rohingya people by the military who engaged in religious persecution to annihilate a people. These were nothing less than crimes against humanity. The NUG has rightly condemned these actions and it is fitting that Weiwei Nu is with you today it is important to know that the risks that the Rohingya face have only intensified since the coup and 600,000 Rohingya people remain in apartheid-like camps. Armed co conflicts are raging all over the country in one ethnic area after another and so many other places as well. The bravery of Myanmar women in resisting the military has been an inspiration to the world. Women in your country have been on the front lines of the anti-coup protests. One form of protest has been women hanging their wraparound skirts over the streets or barricades and using them as flags. You know the superstition. If a man passes under women's clothes, he loses physical and spiritual virility. I have heard that some soldiers were fearful of going under the skirts and their avoidance has given protesters much needed time to get to safety. As you continue your resistance and work for a better future, we join you in your call for stronger sanctions against the junta, including aviation fuel sanctions. Oil and gas enterprises are a financial lifeline for the military. They are state and crony owned and should be included in the sanctions regime. Hence, I believe that we, we in the United States should follow the EU's lead and sanction oil and gas enterprises. Moreover, the United States should issue a Rohingya genocide determination to hold the junta to their account for their past atrocities, to hold them to account for their past atrocities, which empowered and enabled the junta to perpetrate post-coup ongoing egregious human rights violations with impunity. I wish to note that Burma's ethnic populations have suffered decades long abuses and humanitarian assistance to local border organizations, as you know well, is also critically needed. Burmese women have been accustomed to being relegated to the margins, as are the ethnic minorities, relegated to, second, to secondary status. But time and again, despite efforts to push you to the outskirts of society, you have moved to the front lines of change. You have defended human rights and fought, for example, against laws regulating the marriage of Buddhist women to non-Buddhist men. You have run for office against great odds. You have struggled for peace and worked to bring the framework of Security Council 1325 
on recognizing women's role in peace and security to greater reality, to address the conflicts in the ethnic regions. And now you are fighting against the junta, working through the NUG and in other ways, even though you have been forced into hiding, even though you have suffered threats and so many imprisonment. And yet you continue to lead. You and others have both resisted and continue to resist. And you have pushed forward a national unity government that is inclusive. Today, it is another example of your call to action for the fullness of gender equality. You know, it's been over 25 years since the fourth UN World Conference in Beijing took place. It was there, as you will recall, that Hillary Clinton declared women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. The platform for action called for women's rights to education and health care. The right to be free from violence, the right to participate fully in the economy and political life of your countries the right to be free from discrimination. The women of Myanmar, like many around the globe, are still struggling to achieve the full protection of women's rights as human rights. Today's observance calls for all of us to renew our efforts. So I join you in working to break the bias once and for all and to reject dictatorship. Happy International Women's Day, a day to renew the full equality of women, and a day to know that we at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security will continue to work with you and support you. My best to each and every one of you. Well, we would like to thank um, Ambassador Aviva for her um, encouraging uh, message today. Um, sad not to see her in person, but um, what a great video. So thank you so much. Um, just would like to remind everybody to retreat our videos, support Myanmar, and we have the hashtags in the chat box that you can copy and repaste. Um, don't forget to change your profile photos as well um, in order to keep this flame of women's rights um, active and ongoing. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I guess I was asked to introduce myself properly. <laughs> um, as a moderator, sometimes you're not too sure how to, when to come in, but I think um, I just introduced myself briefly so that um, you know who I am. Um, I, I'm originally from Myanmar. Um, so my name is Tin Mama U and um, my family were the uh, political refugees after the Myanmar military coup in the 1988. Um, so my family and I were, you know, extremely lucky and fortunate um, to be accepted as a quota refugee for settlement in New Zealand. Um, and we arrived in New Zealand in year 2000, so that was 22 years ago. So even though I missed out on um, schooling opportunities in Myanmar and in Thailand because of the disruptive lifestyle and as a refugee, um, I was never allowed to go to any school. Uh, but um, luckily for me, since arriving in New Zealand, um, I had a chance to begin my education journey. And now I've got a um, Bachelor of um, Arts in Political Science and Management and, you know, gone on to finish my honours with international relation. And now I am um, finishing my final year of master's with the international relations and political science. So um, it is a privilege sometimes I feel that as refugees, um, you know, only a small percentage of refugees are accepted into the third country for resettlement. So I am one of the lucky one. And with that, I 
feel responsible and have a duty um, to do whatever I can to continue our um, activities, um, supporting um, Myanmar with its democracy and defending human rights. Um, unfortunately, since the Myanmar military coup in February 2021, I have been actively um, you know, involved in the pro-democracy movement in Myanmar. And, and also I'm the founder of the Democracy for Myanmar Working Group um, New Zealand, and we are called DFN in short. Um, so we are a group of activists focusing on political and diplomatic advocacy movements with New Zealand politicians and other stakeholders. Um, I'm the chairwoman of DFM and I'm really proud of um, my team for their great efforts supporting the National Unity Government and our human rights defenders. We have also established um, a support group for our Ministry of Women, Youth and Children's Affairs of NUG. Um, basically, that support group is to um, look for funding. Uh, we do fundraising. We do whatever we can to support our lovely Excellency, um, Susanna Lalaso. And um, we wholeheartedly wish to see our Myanmar country to be democratic. And not just a democratic now, I think as I grow older, I realize a federal democracy is so important for our country where equality and ethnic uh, people's, um, you know, opportunities as an equal being is really important. And I'm really glad to see Ma Weiwei here today, um, who is a strong activist, you know, um, as a Rohingya. And we all know what has happened to our Rohingya brothers and sisters. Um, and they are still suffering so much right now. Uh, with that, um, I am now going to introduce you to our lovely sister, a strong advocate, um, Ma Weiwei. So I'm just going to read you a brief uh, introductory statement about who um, lovely Weiwei is. Um, so Weiwei Nu, she is the founder and executive director of Women's Peace Network. Um, and she's a visiting senior research fellow of UC um, Berkeley Law Center. So after seven years as a political prisoner in Burma, uh, Weiwei Nu emerged as a prominent voice fighting for equal rights and democracy. In 2013, she founded Women's Peace Network. Since then, she has tirelessly fought against the political oppression, violence against women, youth, and marginalized communities, especially those from the Rohingya, uh, from the Rakhine state. Her continued peace building efforts have earned her national and international recognition, uh, including listed at Time Magazine, Next Generation Leaders 2017, and the City of Athens Democracy Award 2021. Weiwei Nu received her bachelor's degree in law from the University of Yangon in Myanmar and obtained her master's degree in law from the University of California, Berkeley. Very impressive profile. So, by the way, I would like to welcome you to um, introduce and talk about um, the discussion topic that you have prepared for us. And warmly welcome to you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. It is indeed an honor to be here. And thank you for uh, including me in this important panel and an important day. Um, Despite the nationwide pro-democracy movement, the Myanmar military's attempted coup last year has exacerbated the situation for all Myanmar's ethnic women. On this International Women's Day, we must remember that the Myanmar junta includes the same forces that brutalized ethnic communities for generations before this coup. Um, like what the United Nations Independence International Fact Finding Missions and my organizations, Women's Peace Network, and many other Remise civil society organizations have reported for years, the Myanmar military continue to, to uh, Myanmar military committed mass atrocities 
mask um, atrocity crimes against these communities, including genocide against Rohingya. Among them, women and girls in particular have been targeted with rape and the most brutal form of sexual and gender-based violence. Victims and survivors of such atrocities still await justice. For Myanmar's ethnic women, the military's brutality is nothing new. The military is a patriarchal regime that only serves to destroy us. And decade-long failure to hold these perpetrators accountable for their international crimes is what emboldened them to topple an elected government and terrorize all of Myanmar's women today. Since the attempted coup, facing further atrocity crimes, ethnic minority women in particular are being re-traumatized. For over a year, hundreds of thousands of women in Chin, Kachin, Karan, Shan, and other areas um, resided by our country's ethnic minorities have been forced to flee from their hunters in discriminate use of airstrikes and other heavy, heavy weapon, weaponry. However, as they are denied access to refuge, they are left to risk their life to survive as military continue to destroy their houses, schools, and other civilian properties, including um, medical facilities. At the same time, these areas of armed conflicts, ethnic minority women are at serious risk of being subjected to the junta systematic use of sexual violence and torture. Like the rape of two Chin women last November, and the junta continued to commit sexual violence as a weapon of war against most vulnerable communities. In Rakhine State, Rohingya women and children face deliberate and targeted forms of tortures as they are imprisoned for fleeing the hunter's systemic oppression. Just yesterday in Magwe divisions, the military soldiers raped a mother, killed her three-year-old, and adopt, adopted her 11-year-old daughter, as well as at least 29 more civilians. As Myanmar women and children continue to be detained, more and more of them face torture, sexual violence, and rape threat in countries' squalid prisons. We cannot bear another year under the brutal hunter. And we cannot have a future in this country, in the country, in this situation. The attempted coup has reminded us that the justice must be served to all the victims and survivors of the military's brutality. Holding the junta accountable is the key step to achieving this justice, which must be truly inclusive and democracy. Over the past years, I have seen more and more of our people confronting the history that has long been used to divide us. I continue to be inspired by young women and students who have publicly recognized decades-long suffering of our ethnic minority sisters and apologizing for staying silent. This also applies to Rohingya as well. For decades, my community was being subjected to genocide in our own country while Myanmar was beginning to see the change. Over 800,000 Rohingya were forced to flee our ancestral homes in Rakhine State. Yet, Believing in a truly inclusive future, I allowed myself to feel hopeful after I was released from the prison. When it has been challenging in the past years, today I am once again beginning to regain that hope from our nationwide movement for a federally democracy, federal democracy, democratic union, and against all forms of discrimination. And unlike the past, I know that this new movement will persist, even if the genocide against Rohingya continue. Like the decades before, the Myanmar military is systematically persecuting Rohingya remaining in Myanmar, including confining women and children in Rakhine State IDP's camp, arresting over 800 people attempting to flee these oppressions and targeting us with hate speech and other form of racist propagandas. 
I trust that my fellow people of Myanmar will continue to voice their oppressions to all of the military's atrocities across the country. And I hope that the national unity government and the international community will continue to take necessary measures to end all forms of impunity. This includes meaningfully engaging with the ethnic minority women, including Rohingya women. In our path for federal democracy, we must establish a comprehensive plan for repair and rehabilitation for these women and ensure that they are included as a key stakeholders. In our new Myanmar, restorative justice must be also accessible to all of our country's people. For this to happen, our leadership must recognize the suffering for what it has been. Referring to the International Court of Justice here in last week, we hope that the military crimes against our community will be recognized as genocide and our equal rights restored and our safe repatriations is guaranteed. Today on the International Women's Day, the people of Myanmar are united under a common enemy. However, what is more important is this unity to be truly inclusive, equal and just. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mawe Wei. Um, you're such an inspiration. I read so much about you. Um, it is so great to see our activists from Myanmar going international and, and creating such a, a platform for you to voice on behalf of our ethnic minorities, especially so for our ethnic women. So carry on and um we believe in you and uh we'll keep on being your number one fan <laughs> all right um i just would like to remind our audience that please if you do have a question please um post your question in the chat box um and our team will do our best to capture all of your questions and then we will have the question and answer sessions toward the end so please note down all your questions um, in the chat box and then we will respond to them accordingly. Um, our next speaker, which I would like to introduce to you, um, is a very dear to me as well. It's um, Debbie Stohart. So she was introduced to me about 15 years ago when I finished my university that Timama I go to the border and go get some lessons from Debbie about international human rights. Um, but you know, I didn't have an opportunity to see her face to face uh, until today via Zoom. Um, but she is a, a strong uh, activist and a very well respected um, across Asia and in New Zealand. She's a well known within our political activist community. And obviously, she's also our international um, well known activist. So, Debbie is. Um, the founder and coordinator of the Alternative Asian Network uh, on Burma. And she is, hang on, so she's a, um, uh, yes, she's a founder and coordinator of the um, LCN Burma, the Alternative uh, Asian Network on Burma. So I would like to welcome Debbie to um, do your presentation to our audience. Debbie, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Tin Mama Hu. Um, uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge uh, Acting President Dua Lashila, um, our dear, dear uh, Minister for Women, Youth and Children's Affairs, Nor Susanna, Her Excellency Nor Susanna Lala. So, and I also noticed that the NUG Minister for Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management um, uh, Uwin Mia A is also in the room. Um, uh, it's very much appreciated that we have senior men from the NUG here uh, showing their solidarity by their presence and giving their time. Uh, I hope that they're not just giving their time, but also giving their attention and the commitment that's required to break the bias. So I was asked to talk about economy. And I think we know what has happened 
to the economy that was growing during the time of transition. And within less than a year, under the junta's brutality, it's violence not just to civilians, but basically the very fabric, the very livelihoods that people depend on to survive, has seen the chat uh, lose half its value. The, the World Bank estimates that the economy shrunk by 18%. If there was no coup and no COVID, the economy would have actually grown by 30%. What does that mean for people on the ground? Especially the ministers of home affairs all around the country. Because when I first became involved in the Burma movement, people would tell me that they, were, they would refer to the female heads of household as the wives and the mothers as ministers of home affairs because they were the ministers of their homes. This coup was not just against the elected members of parliament, the elected cabinet members, but also against all the ministers of women of home affairs of so many households around the country. What does that mean? It means that the price of food, the price of fuel, and the price of imported goods like medicines that are needed to keep people alive has gone up. It means that the price of rice has increased by more than 40%. Literally, military violence, the junta violence, is not just killing people, but robbing people of the food out of their mouths and their plates. It is projected that this year, the number of people living below the poverty line in Burma will be 50%, which is a dramatic and tragic and disastrous increase. Now, I have been privileged to deliver workshops and trainings all over the country of Burma, as well as in the border areas. And one of the trainings that I have been involved in delivering is on economic literacy, looking at economic policy and encouraging people from the grassroots to talk about economic policy. And that those are workshops that we've delivered uh, in the president's own territory in Maijayang, Liza, Michina, also in other parts, in other states and regions of the country. And one of the things we noticed, you know, women were very often 50% of the, uh, at least 50% of the participants. And we noticed that women were much more thoughtful when it came to the development of economic policy. So one of the things that we really need to understand in order to rebuild this, con this economy after the, um, after Min Aung Lang is dragged off to the International Criminal Court and this, and this junta is removed, is in order to rebuild the country's economy, we need to ensure that women's voices are heard, that their energies are appreciated. Don't ask them to go back to the kitchen, now the revolution is over, because you will have a harder time to rebuild the country. Now. According to the census, women are 52% of Myanmar's population, women and girls. In conflict areas, in places where there have been long-term conflict, women are actually a larger size of the population. So if we are talking about democracy, we need to see those faces and those voices and that leadership included. And that includes the leadership of young women like Wei Wei Nu, who not only is a genocide survivor, but was also a teenage political prisoner. She grew up in insane prison. So I think we do need to understand that. And we do need to understand one thing. The courage of women cannot be underestimated. Not just the courage to protest and resist and bang pots and pans like the aunties and the grannies did 
from the houses and apartments all around the country, but the courage also to apologize. And this is why I said yes and cancelled everything to have the pleasure and the honour of being on this webinar. It is because the Minister of Women, Youth and Children's Affairs asked me, why will I give, why will I cancel everything for her? Because she built my trust in the NUG by publicly apologizing for not having been there, not having worked hard enough for the ethnic women, men and children, including the Rohingya when she was in government. It takes a lot of courage to make, to admit that one has made a mistake in the past and it takes a lot of courage to keep moving on. So this is why when we talk about women's leadership and courage, I hope, President, now you're in the room, you will understand that your minister has been an incredible asset for people who have been distrustful of the NUG because of the historical baggage of discrimination and exclusion that the previous government had. And I'm going to say this very openly but respectfully that, you know, the title of this webinar is Break the Bias and Reject Dictatorship. In order to reject dictatorship, we need to break the bias. I would say in the case of Burma or Myanmar, the bias has been the prob one of the problems. The bias against ethnic, um, uh, different ethnic groups, against social minorities, like the LGBT plus community, and also against women in general, especially younger women. We need, if we are talking about culture, let's not forget, we should not use culture and tradition to marginalize people or restrict them. Remember, in a democratic society, it is the people in the society who redefine what is their culture? We need to understand that we can maintain our ethnic and religious identities, but still adopt a revolutionary culture because we are in a revolution. And the NUG is supposed to be the revolutionary government. And in order to do that, we can take the lead from the Tamain Revolution that women broke that taboo by waving their tamains. And when they did that, they actually prevented or they actually bought time for people in the neighborhoods to escape from military and police crackdown. And this is where we have to understand, this is how we change culture, how we break taboos to recreate a revolutionary and democratic and general federal union, which is all what we want. So I started in this movement in the late 80s, although I'm a foreigner, I'm a Malaysian. At that time, my hair was black. Now my hair is white. Please, do not let me go bald before the bias is broken. Thank you so much. It's the time to act is now and let's actively work against these biases. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, uh, for being so real and raw. <laughs> I think that's what it's all about is breaking bias and um, reject dictatorship. And I, I, re I really like the statement that um, Debbie said, the courage to apologize. And I think that's very important too, is sometimes, you know, in politics, we tiptoe too much uh, and we want to please everybody and, and we don't want to rock the boat. And, and so some, sometimes things can be seen as biased or not being acting enough or you made an innocent mistake that create a lot of assumptions 
and put you in a completely different category. And I think um, when we all have the best intentions for our people, for peace, security and stability, and most importantly, for federal democracy, and it is such a new ideology and terminology that we are now having to adapt, tend to understand. And it is with great courage and strength by all our ethnic communities that finally everybody joined and united as one fighting for one thing, and that is federal democracy moving forward for our country united as one. So I think we can only heal together and move forward as a team to fight against this oppressor and the perpetrator, which is our military dictatorship over in many decades, uh, especially now since I'm doing a lot of research on our Myanmar history and the history of military dictatorship and why they exist. And I have to tell you that um, I also do apologize um, for in the past not knowing enough about the Rohingya cases because we are so blinded, especially with us refugee children growing overseas. A lot of us young people, we just don't know the truth and the real history of our own country. And I think um, this is the time for all of us to learn, to adapt, and to forgive. So when ones apologize, ones have to also have the courage to forgive and move forward as one for the greater good. So thank you, Debbie, for reminding all of us to keep our um, spirit of fighting for equality, to reject the dictatorship, and move forward for a democracy together in harmony. Um, I would like to encourage everybody to please um, type your questions and if we don't have enough time today to answer all your questions, I'm sure that there will be other opportunities that your questions will be answered. Um, we have our Facebook and YouTube live that uh, if you check your chat, chat box right now that you can retreat, share and review this webinar um, at the later stage. Um, so Debbie was our last speaker, and then I'm just going to quickly check. We have our question and answers now before our lovely Excellency Susanna is going to do her um, closing remark. So before we have our um, Excellency um, Susanna Lalaso, um, I will present the questions that were presented to me. Uh, the first question from the audience is, what is the very first thing the people of Myanmar would like the world to do to help them? So this means regarding, yep, that's the first question. What is the very first thing the people of Myanmar would like the world to do to help them? I wonder if um, Ma Weiwei might, would like to answer that question or Debbie, the floor is open. Um, thank you very much. Uh, based on our uh, engagement with the many uh, civil society organizations and lever leaders from the from the spring revolutions, um, and I, I I I trust in the rep, uh, the the excellencies from the national unity government can also answer these questions um, better than and and you know any of us. Uh, but based on our uh, conversations and and engagement with the movement and our own quest um, is that the the international community to support the voices of people of Myanmar, to listen to the voices of uh, people of Myanmar. That's the first and most important thing. And that's where it all began. Um, you know, there are well-intended uh, people, government and institutions, but they, if they don't listen, then the support um, are not being effective. So listening to the people of Myanmar is the first and foremost important thing. And uh, in saying so, there are several calls that we have been making uh, since coup and even before the coup. Uh, that include uh, the accountability for the military for their act, for their crimes, ongoing crimes and past crimes. Uh, second, uh, the targeted sanctions against the military and military institutions. Third, uh, the uh, global arms embargo against the military. 
the targeted sanctions that include like likely the the most important one is sanctionings um moge Myanmar oil and gas enterprise um and again the global arms embargo and um overall supporting democracy movement as a whole like all different actors uh, involved in the democracy movement including the national unity government civil society organizations ethnic organizations ethnic women grassroots organizations working on uh, relief uh, and and uh, humanitarian work on the ground a lot of support, um, the financial uh, support and other forms of resources are required at this point, at this time, and that's what we need. And most, um, um, I guess the most important thing overall uh, among all of this call is that the UN Security Council to act. Uh, there has been delay, there has been, um, uh, you know, um, like a lot of like uh, reluctance around um, taking actions on Myanmar and and we people of Myanmar are quite disappointed that our suffering has been somehow ignored or or um, sidelined it why uh, not never become a priority for the international community where else our people are suffering uh, every day so I think I think you know we now is the time for the UN Security Council to act to ad to adopt a resolutions that include the calls that I mentioned earlier. Thank you very much. Excellent answer, Maui. Thank you, um, Demi. Do you have any comment? Would you like to answer the questions? Yeah, actually, we what we we have said is very very clear um we do need an arms embargo on the military junta and armed groups under their control because we've just uh, we've just uh, seen the arrival of um, uh, more than a thousand missiles from serbia serbia that can be used to hurt civilians so we do need to stop that flow of weapons and technology that the junta and the illegal junta and, and armed groups under their control could use to hurt people. We also need targeted sanctions um, against um, individuals, but also the crony companies and um, and the, the, uh, the companies controlled at the moment by the military, the bodies are control, owned by the, uh, controlled by the military junta, um, because we all know very well that the military junta is made up of soldiers who did not join the military to to help the country they 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 joined it out of greed for the money they could make so we do need to make sure that um that that uh, they are not rewarded financially um, we definitely have an urgent need for cross-border humanitarian assistance it is very, very clear that any aid delivered through Yangon and Nepido will be weaponized by the military, the illegal junta. And therefore, if we need to get help to all those who need it um, the most, and we've seen, if you look at the map now, if you look at the number of attacks uh, and the size of the population in each place, uh, a civilian in Kareni or Kaya State is, was 32 times more in danger of military attack and atrocities than if they were living in Rakhine State. That is how, and we're seeing that in Chin State, Sagain, Karen, Kareni, uh, and, and, and Kachin State, these are the places which are grow, increasingly being targeted. Uh, for attack against civilians, which means that it is actually Im important to make sure that aid can cross the border to help them. And this is where the UN Security Council needs to put pressure on India and China and Thailand to open up the borders to humanitarian assistance. And it's not just about being helpful. In this age of the COVID pandemic, um, not helping people on the ground is basically destabilizing human security in the entire region. And let's not forget that most of the people in these ethnic areas are not helpless either. They're ethnic health organizations. You saw in the video people uh, running schools, you know, 
uh, even after their school is bombed and their hospital is bombed, they're still able to work. So it's not like we have to bring people with expertise. We just need to get resources across because people on the ground have a lot of experience and knowledge and skills to be able to help their own communities. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Um, the other questions we have, I believe this will be for um, Her Excellency Susanna. Um, the audience asks, regarding the documentary, a, um, uh, a young woman asked, I want to ask the world, please don't just watch. What strategies are in place on the part of the NUG to increase the visibility? So that's the first question. And I think lead by, um, do you have any plans to care about refugees, children's education and health? Um, Your Excellency, do you have you got the questions both together? Uh, I'm not clear about the first question. Um, okay. but, uh, how about the video? Ask the, uh, asking about the video, I'm not clear. Yes, um, so the audience watched the video and he, um, they saw a woman ask um, the world, please don't just watch. So based on that statement, um, our audience wants to know what strategies are in place on part of the NUG to increase the visibility. So how can, how, um, any plans for NUG to raise those voices at the international platform, I would say, yeah. Okay, uh, so this is the document, uh, the recent documentation. So last week uh, we visit to to the front line uh, to have the to get the assessment of the casualties and also the the, the situation of women and children attacked by the air strike. So I was there and then I traveled with my team and meeting with the Somali. Uh, villagers and also the refugees and uh, we we also uh, visit the schools and hospitals affected by impact by the air strike. So as you see in the uh, in the uh, uh, video, uh, you can see how uh, impact of the uh, SAC using air strike to the to the ethnic area, uh, so terrifying. And also the people are, you know, they feel, uh, they feel the impact of this uh, attack, you know. So uh, the strategy, yes, um, uh, our uh, NUG uh, government, we have uh, the strategy that, uh, uh, so our um, one of the cabinet member also here, uh, please correct me if, if I'm, I'm wrong. The first one is diplomacy strategy. So we stretch out all of the, uh, all of the panels and all of the channels and all the communications to the uh, UN and ASEAN and EU and um, some of our uh, uh, the, the NUG minister also uh, physically uh, visit to the internationally and then spread out like our, you know, walk and also uh, to walk with us and to, to stand with the people of Myanmar. The first strategy is the diplomatic strategy. The second one is the economic strategy. So as um, Debbie said, this uh, the, the attempt could uh, deteriorate all the economic situation of Myanmar. So we need the basic uh, like uh, rehabilitation and uh, to support the uh, rehabilitation of the economics. So uh, we are trying very hard. The third one is the humanitarian assistance. So um, we are doing like cross-border assistance and also uh, COVID vaccine, uh, like COVID vaccine uh, operation 
in, in uh, through the cross border to Shansky, to Karini, to Karen. So these are, we are working very hard uh, for the people of Myanmar. So uh, this is our short and uh, visible strategy that we are uh, doing now. And the second question is education. So um, we have a Ministry of Education. They work closely with ethnic education and ethnic education department to promote the federal education. We have done a lot of workshops and, and a meeting with the um, our ethnic education uh, groups. I myself, uh, I, be, uh, I serve the people of Myanmar uh, as a capacity of minister. But on the other hand, I belong to uh, Korean nationalities. So I also serve as uh, education head of the education committee of the area that I, I share. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. And, and uh, we also hope that uh, uh, we are now trying to have our foundations of federal education. And uh, we hope that in another short years, we can continue full place of education, federal education system. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Your Excellency. Um, I just would like to, um, while, while we have um, our uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Wim Yat A, I think it is only um, fair to, to invite His Excellency to make a few comments. Um, before I invite His Excellency, I would like to provide a brief introduction about our minister. Um, so, Minister um, is a union minister for the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Disasters Management, um, Dr. Wimya A. Um, so he is here with us today. And I think the question is a little bit related to um, our minister. So, um, Excellency, may I invite you to make a few comments if you wish? Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, uh, actually, in short, uh, 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 actually, the answer uh, by, given by the Susanna is perfect and no need to add. But uh, I would like to say visibility is very important and we must have loud voices to the international community to make it happen in reality. And also justice is very important. So to make uh, it happen is very important for all of us. And I have strong commitment to reject dictatorship to move to reach the Federal Democratic Union, to get uh, together with all of you and all of our women in Myanmar and all of the people in Myanmar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Your Excellency, um, I would like to, th this is for Excellency Wimya A. Um, the, the question that referred to Her Excellency Susanna Lalaso was the uh, refugees, education and health. Uh, from, uh, I think that might relate to uh, your department as well. So do you have any plans for our refugee children's education and health? Uh, actually, I'm only, because of this revolutionary government, I only, I'm, my ministry is only meant for the uh, emergency humanitarian assistance and disaster management. And the education in the IDB is uh, together with our Ministry of Education and led by Dr. Zoe Su. But we are working together. Uh, we have planned actually for education, we have planned and education now we have the online and on ground education. And online education is now starting and, and on ground education is also planned to do if the situation is uh, uh, feasible. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, I think that those two, with Her Excellency Susanna Lalaso and our Minister, um, provided a very good answers. Now, the follow-up question is, uh, where's the other one? Okay, 
what we should do to bring justice for many of the women and girls who suffered sexual violence by the military regime. So the question is, what should we do to bring justice for many of the women and girls who suffered sexual violence by the military regime? Any takers on this one? I think panelists first, then uh, we can add some. Yeah. Go ahead, Debbie. Um, I think uh, we, we also called for accountability, and this is why we really need to understand that uh, in order not just to bring justice, but in order to prevent recurrence of these types of atrocities, we need to get uh, accountability and justice for the victims of these atrocity crimes. And we need to prevent the perpetrators uh, from ever entering any parliament or any government um, um, post in the future. We need to vet them out and change the system. But in the meantime, um, it's very important to also understand that the bias in the society against women and girls who have been subjected to sexual violence actually prolongs their pain. Um, we really need to break this bias and understand that they are victims of crimes. It was beyond their control. And instead of objectifying them or gossiping about them or avoiding them, we need to um, help them return and be felt as though they are valued and that they are part of their society. Uh, too many victims of sexual violence have been ostracized. And because of that, many other victims who uh, keep quiet and are silenced because of this social stigma. So this is something we need to understand. Even 30 years ago, there was such a strong social stigma about the sexual violence by the military that people, groups did not document it. It was only after the Shan Women Action Network, SWAN, uh, started to report license to uh, rape that then people started to understand that it is absolutely important to acknowledge this serious crime and find ways to address it. So I think this is something that we need to ensure, whether it's Rohingya, whether it's Kachin, whether it's Burman, whether it's any woman or child or even man who has been subjected to sexual violence, they need our care and support. They do not need our social safe stigma. And this is how, in the short term, while we are while we are fighting to get justice for these crimes, how we can restore their self-respect, their self-esteem, and 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 help everyone and them understand that they are not the crime that they suffered. They are more than that. They are a living human being with something to contribute. So I think this is something we need to understand. Um, and, and, and to be perfectly honest, the amount of sexual violence, harassment, and rape of women in Myanmar, in Burma, is vastly underreported. It's only if the child or the victim has been so seriously hurt that they require medical attention that we know about this. And if, if the rapist was from their own community, there's even greater pressure to cover up that crime. And sometimes they even say that, oh, it's a misunderstanding. This girl agreed to have sex because she thought this guy is going to marry her. But actually, it was a rape. It wasn't even consensual. So I think we do need to actually understand that. And, and, and one of the biases also in many communities is that women are feeling pressured to get married before they are 30 because they are not respected by society or their community if they are still single or if they don't have children. So all of these things add up and create an environment where women and girls are constantly at threat. So we do need to address this. 
And if you're talking about getting help to the country, I noticed like, how do we get funds to Burma? Well, there are very many ways and means. There are many alliance organizations that have bank accounts and operating in the border areas. Um, uh, our Minister for uh, Women, uh, Youth and Children's Affairs uh, has her ways and means. The NUG has its ways and means. But we just we don't just need to ensure that NUG is the legitimate is recognized as the legitimate government. We also need to make sure there are resources for civil society actors and community organizations to scrutinize, engage, and keep the NUG accountable as a democratic government as well. And also, one more thing. What we really need to do is, uh, um, NUG has, in the middle of last year, promised to abolish the 1982 citizenship law. Now, last week, the illegal junta tried to use this law to so-called revoke the citizenship of many NUG cabinet members. So now you are also Rohingya, you know that? So it's time to really, really abolish that law. Um, so, um, you know, I, earlier in my remark, I emphasized, I put emphasis on the sexual violence. Um, and so I would like to break down some of those to more details and, um, add to what Debbie has already said. Um, first of all, that was the excellent questions that we have to ask every day. So to break down the issue of sexual violence, I think first, we have to recognize the seriousness of the sexual violence in Myanmar. The sexual violence committed, sexual violence in general, and then the importance and the seriousness of the sexual violence committed by the Myanmar military, historically and today. That recognition is the most important. From there, we need to take steps to prevent such uh, atrocity crimes from uh, recurrence and to stop the ongoing crimes and to bring justice for the victims and survivors. That those steps should include uh, several parts. Before that, I also like to emphasize the justice sector and the access to justice in Myanmar. The Myanmar justice sector has been severely destroyed and corrupt and incapable of addressing such a serious international crimes. Therefore, the NUG government and new governments um, in the future must recognize that reality and understand the nature of crimes as a international crimes could amount to sex, uh, um, uh, crimes against humanity or genocide or war crimes. And that has to be brought to the international an international court, whether it's at the ICC or in an ad hoc tribunal. But it has to be um, prosecute, prosecuted in an international, independent, capable international court for in terms of bringing justice. Uh, but justice as a whole is broad. So going back to the community, to the ground, I think there are steps that we have to be taken. First, we need to be able to provide adequate relief and rehabilitation for the women in on the ground, survivors and their children, their family. As Debbie said, they continue to suffer uh, marginalizations and trauma all all the way long until they see maybe justice for their for themselves and a lot of this is the experience of a lot of Rohingya women in the camps or many ethnic women in in Karen state Kachin state and Shan state they continue to live with this trauma now seeing the Myanmar military back and it's re-traumatized them I think this is something that we have to really see and think seriously to relieve their trauma, to provide them with the mental health support, other physical health support, livelihood support, 
and other forms of support that they can continue to live as a regular person with dignity and respect. So that is one of the key areas that we have to pay attention to. And moving forward, I think the national unity government and the future government must have a comprehensive uh, transitional justice uh, process that has a heavy focus on addressing sexual violence and including survivors, victims and survivors in all the way uh, bringing justice for their, for their, for their suffering. And the, all of this approach has to be victim centered by listening to them and by understanding what they want for, for what does justice mean for them. And that process is a huge task for, I think, all of us. And, and it has to be, we have to be able to do it. And then after that, you know, implementations in an inclusive and fair manner for all uh, victims across the country is important. And so that, you know, we will be able to uh, stop the occurrence of this violence and we'll be able to restore dignity and freedom for our uh, women and girls, including, I mean, those sexual violence are not actually limited to just women and girls. There are cases that men are being targeted, LGBT communities are being targeted, and all has to be able to address and acknowledge and um, recognize and uh, restore justice for all of them. Thank you. Thank you, our uh, panelists for the response and I also would like to add uh, some points that uh, for that questions for the mm, yes uh, according to um, our uh, reports and records there's are more and more sexual violence and violation to the women and girls and yeah LGBT are we can see more case uh, more case when the the the, uh, the military gender they they committed uh, the cases uh, more and more now uh, since the military coup, so we also get the the, the report uh, from our network and our representative. So um, uh, that's how uh, we work uh, when we get the the uh, information. We rectify and we also set up the, the mechanism uh, to inform double I double N uh, for the UN mechanism. We have the software and also we have the task force team that we immediately update the soft, uh, the, the data and then directly link to double I double N. Uh, because you know that the, the internal justice system is very much um, uh, not strong and uh, we could not uh, rely on. So first, we are setting up uh, our system with the international uh, justice. But we also work closely with our Ministry of Justice uh, for the transitional justice. So uh, now we are working on the uh, system transitional justice uh, and we also have uh, the support system uh, uh, to the survival. So as a, as a, a ministry, we have the program for the uh, survival, like counseling, and also the, the financial support and also the medicine support for them. And we also train the women network in the conflict area and also camp leaders for the counseling and also take care of the survival. So um, yes, uh, as a like revolutionary uh, uh, government, we are not 100% perfect in the ground level, but we are doing our best to protect our women and, and the communities uh, from the sexual violence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for also participating in answering these questions. Um, um, sadly, Weiwei has to leave, so um, she has excused herself. Uh, I just would like to sincerely um, and graciously thank Debbie 
and, and all our panelists here today, um, great discussions and amazing answers. And I think they are also a very constructive um, suggestions and answers and solutions. So what a great um, discussions today. So thank you, Debbie, uh, for your participation today. And I guess sometimes when we ask a lot of questions about um, holding a, a government on the ground accountable, is it is quite difficult when a, a dictator is ruling the country with um, weapons and rapes and all sorts of atrocity crimes against humanity. So I guess this is the time where we also plead for our international networks and allies to help us, to help NUG, to help the people of Myanmar, um, help us fight against this dictatorship. So the non-interference um, state sovereignty shouldn't exist in this situation when the oppressor is ruling the country with lots of weapons and violence. And I think sometimes, you know, it's good to take us back to um, the UN's uh, principles and doctrines of responsibility to protect. And, and so, so many decades has been discussed about that. And, and the world leaders has promised that we will not let innocent civilians suffer in the hands of oppressors and criminals. But yet we are witnessing today and, and everybody is tiptoeing around and one year has passed and we are still having a lot of discussion, but we haven't got, you know, um, uh, uh, an, an impactful support um, that really drive out these dictators. So I think we need to be quite creative in terms of how do we move forward um, with the help of our international friends. So we'll leave it to our international friends to think about it. Use your liberty to promote ours. And if you are all the international hosts joining from your country, please do your best. Uh, encourage your state foreign policy and help work with our NUG government and get in touch with our NUG government. There's an email address provided for you, um, especially our Ministry of Women, Youth and Children's Affairs. Um, our Excellency Susanna Lalasso and her team are very active and proactively responding to your answers, I mean, to your questions, and they provide answers. So please reach out to NUG, do your best. Let's build our foreign policy and relationship together. Um, with this, I would like to now um finally you know welcome our um excellency susanna lalasso um i just would like to give our audience a brief introduction about her excellency so um her excellency no susanna lalasso is a cabinet member of the national unity government uh myanmar and she is the minister of uh women youth and children affairs uh, ministry uh effective in 2021 um she was also elected as karen ethnic affairs minister for yangon region in 2020 election and uh, she served as a member of parliament of myanmar Luto from 2015 to 2000 2020. Um, she used to be an advocate, activist, and a practitioner for the holistic well-being of women and children in Myanmar. Her Excellency No Susanna organized so many campaigns and events regarding peace building, violence against women, political prisoners, and representing community in meetings with world leaders such as uh, with Obama, Hillary and uh, Dalai Lama during her women activist time. Her Excellency No Susanna Lalasa won the Auto Actions Humanitarian Awards in 2012 at Washington, D.C. as the first Myanmar woman who got that international prestigious award. She was chosen as Woman of the Year in 2012 and 2013 by the Media Group of Myanmar and Women in Peace Building Awards by Women Organization Network of Myanmar in November 2013. Um, so, Your Excellency, I welcome you to give us your final closing remarks, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Timama, who uh, you introduced uh, very well. and. Uh, um, yeah, this is uh, my honor to give the closing remark on the International Women's Day. So today is a like hectic day for the women activists and also the, the organizations. Many organizations have been done different activities to honor this special day. I uh, myself 
I have been uh, involved in so many webinars and so many occasions since in the morning. So um, this is this is uh, my last activity with my ministry. So um, our women, youth, and children affairs ministry uh, international webinar is uh, well done. So thank you very much. My special thanks to our acting president and our guest speaker, Melon, and uh, and moderators. Yeah, our special moderator and honorary panelists. Uh, and and special thanks to and our guest minister, uh, Dr. Winya E, and uh, interpreter who helped us along the webinar. And of course, all the attendees of the webinar. So uh, thank you for your uh, talking points and remarkable uh, points that we have learned this evening. So um, as we have been uh, experiencing more than one year of group, there are so many casualties and impact to our Myanmar women and children. So for the time being, more than 120 women and 100, more than 100 children were killed among the other activists, uh, 1,000. So more than 10,000 detainees were arrested and tortured and killed. So, um, our ministry is doing our best and activities including supporting the political prisoners and also detainees and IDP women and children and youth uh, with the like uh, counseling and also medical uh, support and financial support to the pregnant women and so and so. Our milestone is last year we can have the, the uh, pregnant women supporting with the uh, MOHADM with uh, Dr. Winya A. And we also will do again this year. So the international um, friends, uh, they are helping us these kind of activities and, and implementation of our program. And to make the uh, remarkable milestone of this International Women's Day, I am proudly announced that our ministry has done an assessment and a present a report on the situation of women in conflict. So the, the, the assessment is just finished yesterday and we launched our report today. We can reach out from our website. The assessment report includes the experience during uh, the experience of women during the conflict, livelihood situation of the women, social and health issues, urgent needs and requirements for the immediate response, and losses in the conflicts and access to justice. So uh, I would like to echo some of the response of uh, our, uh, our women in the research code. After we succeed our revolution, we would like to request the civilian government to support a housing program for those who lost their houses. Also, creating job opportunities and providing no interest loans for one to two years. We want to provide the best education for our children after our revolution." Unquote. This is the, the voice of a woman from Karimi. Quote, in the re rehabilitation after the post-conflict, women are standing bravely along with the men in this revolution and conflict. Therefore, after the post-conflict situation, please do not forget us. Please do not forget women. We need, we would like to serve our country 
rehabilitation, and leadership position. We also need the particular program for the women, unquote. This is a voice from Debayin, the kind division. In the midst of eradication and struggles, I can see the rays of hope in their response, in their re reflection. Yes, together we can. As a minister of NUG, I promise that we will have, we will have your voice in our journey. So this morning, I participate in the uh, current women organization celebration of International Women's Day. They honor, they honor the women leaders, the village leaders, those who serve in the village level leadership. And some of the village leader women, they said, after the conflict, the men take over the leadership position so that they have to resign from the women lead position. So, um, we we are well noted that this uh, this suggestion and reflection from our research and our uh, women voice from the grassroots we will win we will we deserve the freedom democracy and prosperity we the women can be the actors builders of our new nation let me echo the opening speech of our president in the beginning of the webinar. Women issues are not something that should concern only to women. We all must play our parts to bring about a world free from bias and discrimination against women. Break the bias, reject dictatorship. Have a happy International Women's Day. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, it has come to the end of our webinar today. So before I say just a closing off and say goodbye, while the Myanmar women, youth and children are suffering under the military regime, on this day, our prayers are also with the Ukrainian women, youth and children as well as all women in other parts of the world suffering from violence and any kinds of oppressions. So on this International Women's Day, we from the NUG Women, Youth and Children's Affairs and the women of Myanmar, our love is with you and our prayers are with you. Please support NUG, support Ministry of Women, Youth and Children's Affairs you can contact us via email and website. Together, we can forge women's equality. And collectively, we can all break the bias and reject dictatorship. Thank you, everybody. May God bless you and give us all the strength. May there be peace. Reject dictatorship. Thank you very much.
Maria, 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 Maria,